guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, so, as per <laughs> last week, my love for Christmas remains and my denial about it ending is very present. So my Christmas tree is still up. But I've gotten a few strange looks from guests I had and so I'm taking it down today, unfortunately. So today I wanted to talk about a relatively controversial topic because I understand both sides, but obviously I'm a doctor, so I have very strong opinions about it and talking about why we strike today. I preface this by saying, yes, we are doctors, and I'm not just putting in doctors here, I'm putting in any health worker. So in Kenya, that would be nurses and um, clinical officers, lab technicians, anybody who works in a hospital or who is a health care giver. Um, and we do take an oath to do no harm. And that's usually used against us a lot, I feel, especially when it comes to strikes because people kind of expect you to work through any situation, no salaries for months, no poor working conditions, uh, you, barely, you, ha you barely have any equipment, no leadership at work, and sometimes that ends up doing more harm than good. So on a personal level, I took part in my first strike, I think I would call it my first Yes, strike in 2016 that went on 2017. It was the longest doctor strike in Kenya to date, it was over a hundred days. And I have to say, I was quite reluctant going into it. So I remember I was on internet at the time and I didn't really, I, I felt uh, guilty about going on strike, which is a feeling that a lot of people who have been on strike can relate with. Uh, but at the time, uh, I talked to one of my consultants about it and he told me, yes, you do feel guilty, but, and we all feel guilty. It's not a situation. It's not like we look forward to, go, to going on strike. It's not like we just, you know, we, we, we sit and we go on strike in, at, at, in an instant. We generally think about these issues for a very long time. We deliberate for a very long time. It's a last resort. It's not the first thing that happens. And that's really important to note. So my personal experience. So we went on strike on, I want to say December 1st, 2016. And then after that, it was just catastrophe after another. So I remember going to protests at Afia House and we would get tear gassed, you know, uh, the doctors, our, our union leaders got arrested, which is very frustrating because the things we were asking for, honestly, were not just for our good, but the good of everybody. And what was really strange to me was the public perception. In the beginning, people understood, you know, they understood that we were going on strike because people hadn't been paid for months. We didn't have medicines where I worked a lot of times we, we wouldn't have essential things. At one time we didn't have saline, which is just water. We didn't have that. We had to get it from the next county. We sometimes would run out of gloves, so you had to stuff your pockets with gloves just in case you ran out. Ordinary things, so the only painkiller you'd have is paracetamol, which maybe for, for people who are in severe pain, you know, mothers who are post-CS or people who, are, who have cancer or other other illnesses that have pain, which honestly is a lot of the illnesses we see, you wouldn't have that. You wouldn't have so many essential things. And personally, and anybody who has worked in a government hospital in this country can tell you at some point you start to supervise death. You go to work knowing, you graduate knowing that you're going to save people's lives. And you're excited and you go work, you know, all over the country and you get there and you have the information, but you don't have the equipment. So you end up losing so many lives that you could have saved. And that's very frustrating because that's not what we do. So uh, there's a term that we use, it's called, it's supervising death. That's, you end up doing that so often. So we were, uh, we were demanding for these things. The public stood with us for, a few days 
and then after that, you know, hashtag started on Twitter and we were called greedy and it became doctors against the country, the entire country, the government and the public, everybody else. I think the only people who understood our efforts were other health workers. So nurses also went on strike around that time. You know, people who have worked in healthcare in in the hospitals understand the situations but it was very disheartening to me to not have that support because in my mind I thought ultimately we are fighting for you we're fighting to make sure that when you come to hospital you don't have to be told oh we don't have this I don't know metal rod for an implant you need to go and buy it elsewhere we don't have an MRI in the hospital, or we do, but there's nobody to 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 um, to operate it. So you need to go externally and pay more. And I think, as a doctor, as a healthcare worker, that was extremely frustrating. We would get so much backlash. We got so much backlash. That's probably the first time I've been in Twitter fights with people. The first and the last, <laughs> because I was tweeting about my experiences. And I was tweeting constantly about why we were striking. And I would get such vile responses. You know, sometimes people would insult my family. And I thought, my family uses public health care, you know? So this affects me also. And I understand. I understand. I really understand the the feeling of, of betrayal. But in my mind, we have to understand the... Top, the, the root cause. The doctors are not striking in a vacuum. Nurses are not striking in a vacuum. Clinical officers are not striking in a vacuum. Right now in a situation where across the country, in many counties, nurses or doctors or clinical officers or all three of them together are on strike, which means essentially we've brought healthcare to a halt. And that's not a situation that anybody wants to see, including ourselves. So Coming off the strike in 2017, I because the strike went on into the next year, I remember feeling almost more frustrated. We'd gone through so much. Uh, our, our leaders had been arrested. We hadn't been paid for three months. I moved back in with my parents, as did many of my classmates and colleagues, because how are you paying rent? <laughs> Um, and some of my patients, some of the patients that we were attending to had gotten worse. And there was, I remember telling myself I wouldn't go on strike again because personally I didn't feel like we had achieved what we went on strike for. And that was frustrating to me that we fought so hard for something and we were not able to get it. Um, the president had insulted us, the ministers had insulted us, the courts, the judges had insulted us at one point calling us sewage or something. And that, that's very demoralizing. It's extremely demoralizing to have to go through all that and then come back and still have to face the same situation. So I remember telling myself I wouldn't go on strike again. I, I wasn't going to ever go on strike again. That changed. That changed last year when we started to lose doctors, especially when we started to lose young doctors because of situations that we had gone on strike for before, because of complaints that we had made before. We didn't have health insurance. It's so strange that a lot of us can't actually afford the, the services that we give. And that's true. And that's what happened with one of, uh, our, co one of our colleagues with COVID. And it, I thought, then if I don't, if we don't go and check for this, then why? What, what else? I had promised. I had actually told myself that I wouldn't go and check. And that really, that death really changed how I viewed things. And now here we are with more strikes and tussles between government and, you know, healthcare workers, and the people who end up suffering are the public. So. Why do we go on strike? So the primary reason why people go on strike worldwide, not just in Kenya, the, 
the two primary reasons are poor wages and poor working conditions, which have been a very recurring theme in Kenya. If you look at the strikes currently ongoing, everybody has the same complaint. You haven't paid us in three, four months. We're working with little to no equipment. During this time of the pandemic, we're working without PPE, we're getting sick, we're not able to seek treatment. And those are things that you really have to think about because the government has one of the pillars that the, the president has is universal health care. And universal health care is very dependent on a motivated workforce. If you're not paying your staff, if you're not giving them insurance, if they are still having to work when they're sick in the middle of a pandemic, if you're not giving them PPE, if they don't have drugs, if they're watching patients die, then obviously people are going to go on strike and you cannot hold the oath they made against them because the oath does not make them slaves. And that's essentially what people and the government especially does when they quote the oath at you without taking into consideration that they haven't fulfilled their responsibility. Therefore, I can't fulfill my responsibility as a healthcare worker. People also go on strike because of security issues. We've had doctors and nurses being attacked at work. We've had doctors and nurses being attacked on their way to work at night when they're doing calls. There was a story about um, a doctor who was uh, raped on her way to a night call. I think it was in Kiambu. We've seen these things going all over. And it makes it, it makes it really hard to work when you're afraid of either what will happen to you on your way to work at night because our work is 24 hours a day. We, we don't really stop. Or in hospital, if you're going to be attacked. I had an experience once where I had to hide from a mother who wanted to attack me. And that's just, it, it, it's a long story. Maybe we'll talk about it later. But a nurse and myself had to hide. And there was only one security officer in the compound. So do they man the gate or do they come and protect you? And what happens if you get attacked? Are you protected? Because in that case, we are not on the own. So another reason why um, healthcare workers go on strike is because of policy changes that are made without taking into consideration what is happening on ground, you know? So for example, the First Lady has a the Beyond Zero Initiative, which in which in essence is a good initiative. You know, you want to reduce the maternal um, deaths to zero, but you have you then come in and you say all mothers need to give birth in hospital. They need to have you know essential things, which we all agree on. However, you do not equip the hospitals for those for for the things that you want to you know be done. You don't increase the staff. And you end up thoroughly, thoroughly overworking the staff there with very limited resources and doing even more damage. So that's definitely one of the things we think about, we need to think about that, yes, sometimes um, policies and initiatives are very good. A lot of times they are. But have you put in the groundwork to ensure that they're implemented well and that they're successful and that they meet their goals and that the healthcare workers who are the ones implementing these policies actually understand what is happening and are you working together? Because oftentimes policies are just made at the top and they're communicated down with no infrastructure to make to make sure that, that, that we are able to meet our goals together. Something we also deal with in Kenya especially and I, I think everywhere is discrimination, different levels of discrimination. So for example, a very prominent thing that people who have worked in counties know is that, and I faced this myself, as did a lot of other people, you will go intern in a county. But then when time comes to be hired, they will prefer, and it's not even, it's not even subtle, it's very obvious a lot of times, they will hire people from the tribe in the county and so you're just you know kind of left there and that happens a lot it's something that's talked about but i don't feel it's talked about enough um to the extent that sometimes when people would go to counties you just know uh my name is not from this tribe so i'm not going to work there that's one level of discrimination is in terms of tribalism the other level of discrimination is in terms of promotions and even within the medical fraternity, just the tussles that go on. Sometimes doctors get promoted, while nurses don't get promoted. So doctors are, you know, leveling up. 
or over time but nurses are staying at the same place and promotions are really important they help with motivation that means your salary is going up you're getting more experience and more exposure and things like that so if you're only looking at one um, cadre that's the only one that you're focusing on then you're sowing seeds of disunity in a profession that relies on everybody working together to achieve a common goal so not only discrimination in terms of um, interpersonal discrimination but also within just groups in 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 the medical fraternity and that's something that we definitely need to think about so what happens when we go on strikes the effects of strikes are very dependent on who is striking. And the reason that that happens is because in Kenya, um, healthcare is divided into, well, not really divided, categorized into six levels. In the lower levels, you will have clinical um, officers and nurses running most of the services. And in the higher levels, you have um, medical officers and specialists running higher services. So for example, the lowest level is a dispensary and usually that's a nurse who runs that. They offer just essential services. They don't have um, admissions and they, they mostly do referrals. But take for example, level six would be for example, Kenyatta National Hospital. It's a national referral hospital. And there you find you know specialty services, um, specialty clinics and theaters and um, services that are highly specialist, I've said specialist many times, but yes, essentially that's it. And in between you have different levels and every level is has a, a different level of staffing. So when nurses go on strike, the biggest uh, services that are affected are preventive services and inpatient services. I will say, personally, in my opinion, you cannot run a hospital without nurses. I think I'm not saying you can run a hospital without doctors, but you cannot run a hospital without nurses. Nurses, for me, are the backbone of healthcare. Without nurses, you can't do anything. They do so much and they are so undervalued and so underpaid. So when nurses go on on strike, you have preventive services. They a lot of. Uh, vaccination uh, clinics in the country are run by nurses and family planning clinics are run by nurses um, in inpatient wards are run by nurses essentially because they will be there 24 7 while well, the doctor will come in and do their rounds and go to theater and you know go about their business so when nurses go on strike the effects are more you actually can't work without nurses so when nurses go on strike Preventive services, preventive and promotive services, which are the ones I've mentioned, so family planning clinics, vaccination clinics, those are very, very greatly affected. What that means is that sometimes during the times when nurses go on strike, people are not able to access the services. That means that we run the risk of having many unwanted pregnancies, many um, increased rates of maternal and infant deaths. We run the risk of uh, having diseases that have been eradicated coming back because we are not vaccinating anymore. And that's very dangerous and worsens our healthcare system. Clinical officers, a lot of times will run outpatient departments. So which is um, what happens, which is what is generally referred to as casualties. So in, in lower level hospitals, when you go to the, the first person you see after the nurse to do triage would normally be a clinical officer. So when they go on strike, that means outpatient services are not running. Which essentially means inpatient services are not running because they are the ones who refer patients, inpatient to be seen by the doctor. So you can see how these, uh, we are all connected. So it's impossible for one level of, of one, one cadre of healthcare workers to go on strike and not affect the entire system. When doctors go on strike, you have the same effects as nurses and clinical officers, but additionally you also have um, delayed uh, surgeries, elective surgeries, because then they do specialist clinics. You have um, delayed uh, care for chronic illnesses. So for example, people who have diabetes, people who have hypertension or any other chronic illnesses who see specialists are not able to see them, they're not able to get their medications, they're more prone to getting into long-term complications. I think one of the worst effects of strikes is the fact that 
it decreases um, trust in the public sector, public healthcare system, and increases um, private use. Private healthcare is not bad, but we live in a country where majority of people rely on the public healthcare system. We live in a country where majority of people can't afford to have insurance or other forms of private health care. So it's important that we strengthen our public systems. But one of the things that happens during strikes is that people lose trust. And that's, I think, almost intentional. One of the most striking things that happened when we went strike was <laughs> striking was the the health the, the finance cabinet secretary at the time saying that he he doesn't advocate for paying private for paying doctors in public facilities more because there would be less doctors working in the private in private healthcare. If 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 a doctor in the in the public sector is paid two two times the private sector, what will happen? You will have an influx to the. Public. It was so strange because we live in a country where most people use public facilities therefore you would want most doctors to be in public facilities so that they can serve more people but interests government interest and personal interests really sway how these things work so in in looking for better solutions sometimes we inadvertently make the situation worse another thing that i saw another thing that i personally saw was, and this ties in into the general society and our levels of poverty and our levels of access to healthcare, was that when we went on strike, a lot of people started to look for alternative medicine. Now, I don't necessarily disagree all the time with traditional healers. I think that there is some benefit the traditional um, herbs and things like that. But we can honestly all agree that a lot of times, a lot of them are false, at the very least, and at worst are very dangerous. And because people are not able to afford private healthcare when people, when healthcare workers go on strike, then they end up going to traditional healers and herbalists who sometimes I guess maybe may have good intentions, but end up doing a lot more damage, and patients come in with worse um, situations because they they had no other option. There was nowhere else for them to go. And on a grand scale, looking at the whole picture, um, strikes inadvertently increase poverty rates for people who are poorer because they end up spending having what's called catastrophic spending. Catastrophic spending is when um, the amount of spending that the amount of money you spend on healthcare sends people into debt and into worse poverty levels. So, this is where I said I understand both sides. So, while we go on strike to advocate for better healthcare, we also inadvertently um, disadvantage those who are already poor, those who already couldn't afford other services. And that's something that we have to grapple with. Not just as healthcare workers, but as, hum as human beings, we have to deal with that consequence. And that's not something that goes away easily. So, what can we do? <laughs> I realize that this is a bit of a long video and also a bit of a sad video, I guess. But what can we do? I know that you can't change everything by voting and we have our own issues with voting in this country. But we really need to start voting for people who advocate for better health care. We really need to start to demand better of our leaders. Every day when I watch TV, I get so annoyed when I watch the news. And I remember this incident, well, one of many. Um, I think last year, late last year, when uh, one of the governors said that they want, um, they want helicopters to be able to evacuate them when they get sick with COVID. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity. Also, maybe members want to know. Uh, just as Murunga took almost, uh, I think almost uh, 30 minutes to get to the nearest facility. And uh, while we were talking about it with my colleagues at the uh, cafeteria, 
the question came that we have a problem, uh, Mr. Speaker, in case one of us have the same problem. And you know, the count, you look at the county facilities out there, do not even have oxygen. We were requesting, and I managed to talk to the clerk of this uh, National Assembly, that to be given, we should have a hotline for helicopter just in case, just in case there is a, a problem, one can be able to be, uh, be taken to the nearest uh, facilities possible. And those staying in Nairobi, for example, have a hotline for uh, at least a hotline for the ambulance, which is well equipped to be able to evacuate whoever has a problem. I think and it made me so angry because I thought to myself, you are in charge of your county and you could have, in, in the four or five years where you have been the leader in your county, you should have worked on the healthcare. You should have made sure that the healthcare system is good enough for yourself to use. But you've made it so that it's so bad that even you don't trust that healthcare system, that even you don't want to use it. So when you get sick, you want to be transferred to a private hospital in Nairobi. But what about all those other people there? So demand better. Ask, ask these things. Ask, ask for better things. Ask for um, better leadership. And highlight leaders who, who, who advocate for healthcare. Ask about healthcare. Um, so it, 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 in essence, that means we all have to take part in looking at political leadership because political goodwill is a very important part of achieving good health care in our country. So we really have to be involved. <laughs> Essentially, that's what it is. We have to be involved. We have to be involved in how our country is run, demand better. As a, as a lay person, I mean, we only vote five, every five years. So in the meantime, what do you do? If you use public health care, which a lot of us do, if you see something, say something. Um, if you go to a hospital and you see that one doctor is having 40 of you, say something, because these things actually work. And one of the things that I, I used to do not so much anymore was tweet a lot about things. And social media really does work. It really does work. So put these things out there. Let people know that uh, I see this doctor is understaffed. Or I went, to, I went to hospital and they asked me to buy this, 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 this. Why don't they have it? When you make enough noise, or, or at least we hope, things start to change. So it's important that we be proactive rather than reactive so that we can also prevent, try and get ahead of these things happening. Obviously, one of the parties that bears the greatest responsibility is government. So government responsibility is key. They need to implement um, the changes that they actually say they want to. They need to finance be the healthcare better, need to employ more doctors, we need to have more equipment, and not just have equipment, because we do have um, huge CT scans and things and MRI machines, but then there's nobody to... Uh, to run them. So we need to have those people employed to actually have a functional system. So government responsibility is definitely a big thing. And again, that ties into leadership and how um, involved we are in running our own country. I think for healthcare workers, the thing that one of the things we need to think about is having ethical strikes. And what that means is, first of all, only using strikes as a last resort, which is what currently happens. Usually by the time we go on strike, we have been deliberating with the government for months, sometimes years, and nothing is happening. So only as a last resort. But more than that, to make sure that essential services are still running. So not to just lock down everything. Because while we understand why we're going on strike, we also understand that we work to save lives and to serve people and that the people the people we're fighting for should not be the people getting punished so while we do go on strike we that means that we leave essential services running and and make sure that people are able to to get the bare minimum of treatment that's what an ethical strike is
So as I was researching this video, I read into a lot of papers and I found a quote that I found I thought was really interesting and so I thought I would close this video with that. And this, here it is. The idea that once a person becomes a doctor, they are obliged to work under any conditions, at any time, with any number of patients, would be akin to slavery, which is an ethically indefensible condition. Which is exactly what I was saying about oaths and demanding that healthcare workers work in any situation, regardless of the conditions that they are subjected to. And so in ending, just remember that healthcare workers are human. They have families, they have um, friends, they have responsibilities, they have people who depend on them. They need to be paid, they need to be taken care of, just like any other profession. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this um, educational helpful. And please let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. Bye-bye.